is Boxing Tickets NA in association with Vinyl Gentleman. Um, we're glad to say we're joined with James McGovern. Um, how are you, James? Not too bad, mate. I'm surviving. Um, I'm just to be honest, I'm bored just sitting waiting. I'm, I'm ready just to go. I've had enough. I've had a long training camp. This is going to be a long week. I'm ready just to get to Friday. And obviously, for anybody tuning in, obviously this this is recorded pretty much on the day. This is Wednesday. This is Tuesday. I missed, Tuesday. Missed the day there. But the, obviously with the, the public workout yesterday, and obviously it was only the, the main card that was on there, but was it sort of giving you that jet, that buzz of going, just let me in the ring, just, just let me do something yeah. rather than stand and watch him? It was brilliant. I brought, I brought my cousin and my brother down with me, and then Stuart, my SC coach, thought we'll all go to guards to get a bit of a feel for it. There was kids coming over and going with the same with hat and with the same with gloves and take photos and I'm laughing going it's, it's very strange to me like I'm not used to that yet I suppose but I was sort of laughing myself going Jesus this is, this is going to be the rest of my life but no it was good just to get down see a couple of the boys seeing Big Potty was talking to him and stuff and just get excited just getting the buzz together ready to go for it Definitely does and like and, and obviously I know you made your you know you're coming up actually nearly a year since you made your debut um, but pretty much Friday night is like a prop, like your sort of second debut because you've had the fight in front of no fans so far. So it, it's probably bringing it back home as they go, people are going to be shouting my name, going, all right, James, yeah. you're walking into the ring and you're like, what's going on? Where did these people come from? Well, this is it. This is, we've called it, my dad always called it my second debut. And I'm going to ask him, he always says this is like a second debut. And it is like 7,000 or 8,000, is it 8,000 or 7,000? I think it's 8,000. 8,000 people is the biggest crowd we've ever fought in front of. In the Commonwealth Games, there was a couple of thousand there, I think, in Australia, but it wouldn't have been eight, no way. And the Ulsters and stuff, a couple of hundred, maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe a thousand if you're pushing lucky. But I'm actually excited because all my friends and family get to go. Even in the Ulsters and stuff, they never really went. My family went, my friends didn't really went. All my friends now have got tickets to go and they're all buzzing. They're all taxi saying, what are you walking out to? And can we see your shorts and stuff like that? So... I'm excited for them as well. They actually get to see it live. Mm-hmm. Definitely, as I say, it's that whole fight week buzz. Obviously, I'm not long back from the press two press conferences there, and you've that buzz now. You're going, just what have we got to do tomorrow? There's nothing to do tomorrow, and you're going. Uh, that's the way I am. I sitting here now, not my, my schedule, the fight week schedule, and going. I'd love to just skip this. I said to my missus the other day, I'd love to just sleep until until Friday. Mm. But obviously, you'd miss your way on then. You wouldn't be able to fight. Well, this is it. The whole night, way. I'm having a good crack too. Uh, you're right, as long as you can get back to normal food. Uh-huh. Um, obviously, as it's your first time on with us as well, we always like to do with everybody comes on for the first time, whether they get to know a bit of the backstory. Um, you know, not obviously just present day, but could be amateur boxers watching and you could be an inspiration for them in some way. So what age did you initially start boxing and, and why was it you got into boxing? I think I started about six or seven. Um, there was no real, like one reason I was sort of knocking about my mates and a couple of mates were going to the club um, Danzo my uncle Danny I always call him he had said to me ages ago I remember being at a family wedding and he said when he come down to the box club slay him I never really thought about it and then my cousin started going and I went right I'm going to go down I stuck down one night my man dad would never let me and I stuck down to the club one night I ended up being half decent at it and then Danzo told my dad my dad said to me you went to the boxing club I thought I was getting a scalpel Mm-hmm. But he says, right, you'll, you'll never miss another training now. And here we are. It's it's one of them strange things. Like I always say to people and stuff as well, you either your parents always like to, to get into some, some fighting in some way, whether it's boxing, karate, obviously it used to be, or even MMA now, because it's a way to be able to defend yourself. There's so much mm-hmm. bullying with kids nowadays that even if you decided you start a boxing, that oh, I'll go a few nights, at least you knew you could throw a punch rather than yeah. you know, some kids nowadays somebody hits them a punch and they don't know what they have back because they're too nice and they'll not throw a punch back yeah. and they'll go they'll get bullied very easily because of that. So boxing I would always say is one of them sports where not only does it teach you how to throw your hands, but obviously there's self discipline and stuff as well. Yeah, I find that kids well, any of the kids were to be bullying kids and come to the boxing club, it always grinds you. There's no like one lesson where you come in and you get told how to do these things it just seems to happen like, simultaneously it always happens and kids always sort of learn self-respect and respect for others and discipline so it's one of them sports that will I get my kids into it probably yeah mm-hmm. in the years to come my kids are born will I get them into boxing yeah. I don't know why I want them to fight and compete and do what I'm doing 
but they'll definitely be involved in it some way. It's, it's, it's sort of hard sometimes when you've been involved in a sport, your kids don't get involved in some way. Like, did you find like school and stuff growing up where maybe somebody seen you and they were going, oh, don't be starting on him, he boxes, or somebody go, here, my mate, James going to knock you out, you know, because that was the way <laughs> of the fight. You know, did you Funny find enough, that where, where people would go, my mate, James McGovern, you know, you'll not mess with me. Yeah, I, it's, and I don't, it's more a joke than it is anything serious, but my mate last night in the group chat, funny enough, was saying, I, my bird's going to the fight and blah, blah. And he says, I'd be going about telling everyone James McGovern's my mate, stay away from her. <laughs> I was laughing, but I've never, I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't be big in the fight in the street or any of that old crap. Like, it's, I keep the fighting for a ring. I always say I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. Just happen mm-hmm. to be good at fighting. Exactly, and it obviously helps to pay the bills and stuff as well. Well, it. in due course, obviously, in the early stages of your pro career, you don't really make much, so it's not no, something you'd really go about right going, I'm a pro boxer, yeah, how much do you make? Hmm. <laughs> you know. Funny enough, I walk about, see if anyone asks me what I do, I go, I'm a plumber. I don't even talk about boxing because it just opens up a whole can of worms and people start asking, it's a surreal thing. Like, even on the phone to people and they go, what's your occupation? And I have to go, um, I'm a boxer. It's always a funny one to go on, to, to, to start with. Do you, remember, do you remember the old one where somebody says you're a boxer? I, you, you make boxes, you know? Ah. Uh, you know, you can't box fight. Eggs. I get that. Box eggs. You can't fight your way out of a wet paper bag. You, you, you put sellotape around boxes, you know? Mm. Um, obviously, amateur boxing then for you yourself. Um, I'd probably be better letting you describe your accomplishments as an amateur, but you pretty much done it all, really, in a way, you know? So... Probably yeah, the only thing I didn't do was the Olympics, I suppose. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I had a great amateur career. I loved it. Um, from when I was 11, I was travelling around the world. I went to Russia whenever I was 11 or 12, maybe, to the Europeans, and that's whenever it all sort of started, and I just snowballed from there. Won my first Irish title, and then that was it. Again, the rest is history. I've been all over the planet, boxing, all sorts of tournaments, won medals across the world. Met amazing people along the way, like some of the guys out in Tokyo and I, or some Aiden Waltz, one of my best mates, mm. Kurt Friendly. I've been away with all of them before me and Aiden, Samoa, Australia. Spent loads of time together in the same room and all. So watching him fight and seeing him win medals, I feel like I'm in the medal. I can text him the other day and say something to him, says, I feel like I won a medal at the Olympics. So that amateur experience is more so than the fighting is unbelievable. Like meeting the people I've met and being trained by the people I've been trained by is invaluable. Yes, it does. And like, sort of, I'll, I'll sort of explain that, you know, to anybody sort of looking in. So, European, European schoolboy gold, uh, Commonwealth youth silver, 10 time national champion. Commonwealth youth gold, I won the, I won the youth Commonwealth. Hey, Commonwealth youth gold, as well. gold. Gold yeah, and silver, youth. was it? No, just gold. Gold in the youths and bronze in the seniors. And, and you're also league champion, 10 time national champion, and Commonwealth games, bronze in 2018. So, they say pretty much the only thing you're missing was the Olympics. and I guess, Olympics, yeah. You know, I guess when you sort of, you know, we're, we're getting to the final stages now, obviously, Kurt was obviously very unlucky. Um, yeah. Aiden's won a medal. Kelly's now won a medal. You know. Yeah. It's, it's been a great game, obviously, an Olympic Games for them. Obviously, there's, you can see the passion that's there and every one of them that's there. You know, even Emmett and stuff going out early, they're still there in the togetherness and that's what it's all about. It's a yeah. real squad game. Ah, uh, it's a great team. And the, that team weren't, you could tell the me and all that team weren't totaled to win loads of medals and they've went and they've outdone themselves like they've been unbelievable like everyone was talking about inexperience and oh, it was actually starting to annoy me a bit because even people back home were doubting them I was going, mm-hmm. that's, that's our country out there competing and they've done well like they've sm- Kurt smashed it Kurt I don't think anyone gave a Kurt a chance when he was fighting the number one and he destroyed him and then Aiden as well Aiden when the medals unbelievable like I've seen Aiden's journey myself and he's been up and down and in and out of teams sometimes and it's like some youth teams he was in the way and some senior teams he was in the way and then he just smashed on it and absolutely smashed that tournament. So I'm, I'm over the moon mostly for him. I guess in some ways, obviously, you know, they're some experiencing something different, obviously, in Olympic Games. A lot of them making their debuts there and really no fans. It's only really the other teams and stuff there. But yeah. it'll not take away, you know, it'll not take away the experience they have of... of competing in the Olympic Games and even sometimes even just I know sometimes it's not just to take them part it's about winning and everything else but getting yeah. the Olympic Games is even an amazing achievement as well exactly we said in the club we talked about all the fights and people losing out and stuff like that and I was going listen they're there like that's that's the pinnacle of sport some people say the World Cup but I would always say the Olympics is the pinnacle of sport like that's the biggest sporting event in the world and they're there so to get there 
doesn't even matter if you win a medal or get off in your first fight, you got there. That's the most important thing. Exactly. And we look, I know from Kirk's fight the other night, um, obviously the slow start in the first and lost at 5 0. And then the second round, he won 3 2. And you're going, well, the second round was more of a 5 0 to Kirk than it obviously was nah. for the first. But then obviously just losing out in a split, you know, you can still be very proud of, of sort of where of course he's he can't. He's just, he was he was the one that was sort of first started the whole we have a chance here. When he beat that number one seed, everyone went, Jesus, I think everyone's ears perked up. And might we have a real shot here at bringing home a lot of medals. And they have done and they will do. Definitely. And it, it spurs everybody on, you know, everybody's going, Well, I want to be the next, I want to beat such and such and and, and they just go, We'll just rip up the form book, you know, who cares yeah. who's number one, we'll just go and beat them. Exactly, and that's, that's, that's always been the mentality that Aaron's always had. From I've been in the setup, it's always been, it doesn't matter who you're fighting, they're fighting Ireland. That was always what they always said. Like, you've even seen Kurt say it, Kurt said it and Nathan said it, they're fighting Ireland. Mm. So if someone says, it was it McCormick? Are you fighting McCormick now? And he went, no, he's fighting Ireland's Ian Mulch. And that's always been the mentality down there. And, it, and it's sort of transparent across under the pros now, obviously, with Mick in 2016 and, and, and everybody else sort of transgressing across now. And it seems to be the conveyor belt's working perfect to, to get everybody ready for, for going pro. And, you know, I can't think of the next five to ten years, probably how many potential world champions are going to have. There'll be, there'll be a mountain of us. Like, I, I seen the thing the day, the press conference the day, the guy was saying that Belfast is like the, the, boxing, con- or the boxing city of the world. And it is true, like... It, you look at all these big American cities and all the rest of it, there's none of them can fight like Belfast. Mm. Cap- capital city of box, I always call it. Ah, uh, yeah. You know? um, obviously, for yourself, then you turned pro, you had your first fight in August of last year. Um, obviously, from you moving across from the amateurs, what was the, the decision behind turning pro last year? Well, the amateurs, I was sort of on the road to Tokyo. Um, but then I took a head staggers mentally had problems, I had mental health problems and a lot there I carry on and thought to myself I was just struggling at the time. Around that time of like the I think it was the World Championships in twenty nineteen. I was just struggling big time. Um and I thought I kept going and kept going and kept going and it was just getting worse and worse. And one day it all came to head and I went and told my parents about it. And from there I was sort of went out, we need to get this sorted. So I stopped told John Connell I thought I owed to him to go and speak to him there's no point me just not turning up one week and not being it so I thought I'd go and speak to John went and spoke to him was shit myself on the way up to his house to speak to him and then I was in and it was like a normal conversation your average conversation and I told him what was going on he says right forget about it don't even worry but he says he said to me you're not going to be James McGivern the boxer no more you'll be James McGivern the coach or the plumber or the whatever it is you're going to do and I went away feeling a lot better from that I went right I think it was the expectation maybe got me there. I was thinking mm-hmm. to myself, I felt like the weight of the world on your shoulders. And after that, I felt free. It was like, grand, that's fine. And then I was sitting, sitting in the house and Banzo texted me and says, you're too good, too good to stop. What about going pro? And I thought, you know what? I was starting to not regret it as much. I was starting to get mentally. I was starting to get to deal with it myself. And then I thought, you know what? Why not? We'll give it a go and see what happens. And now we're here. And, and like, you know, obviously the first first. Thing- First thing I'm sort of getting out to the mental health is everything all okay with you now? You know, is the pressure sort of relieved now? You've spoke to someone. There's so much you know around mental health at the moment. You've obviously got the pressure of everything and speaking to somebody, obviously telling them your worries and everything else, and now everything's fine. Yeah, well, I'm at home now, which is the biggest thing. Like being, I was playing Dublin and stuff, and I think that maybe didn't help it because I was on my own. Not on my own, it was with the team and all, but it was by myself. I'm at home now. I live in my own house. I would live with my parents. I'm training with my dad. There's no stress that way. And if there is a time where I need someone to go and talk to, I've got someone, my brother's next door to me, or my sister's downstairs, or my friends and family all around me. Whereas whenever I was down there dealing with it, I was like, I was by myself. So now, I don't want to say I'm completely better, but if anything was to happen or anything comes up, I've got people I can go and talk to. And I guess, you know, sometimes I think the thing around it is whenever you're around, when you were around all the other boxers down there, you nearly sometimes feel like you're going, I don't want to tell them my problems because they maybe just tell me to clear off, you know. And they're all good mates and stuff as well, but sometimes you're going, I don't want to give them the burden and then them feeling down and, you know, st- uh, and starting that way. So I remember, see, now nah, I was talking about it, I remember uh, there was a guy, Kevin, what's Kevin? Kevin McManamo, playing for Dublin. Mm-hmm. He was a sports psychologist. I remember one day we had all 
but throughout the week they'll arrange meetings for you to go and speak to nutritionists and sports psychologists, physically they'll arrange meetings you have to go and do it. And I used to go in and just say nothing. And then one day I went, scrub it, I'm gonna tell him. And that started it, and then he brought in a guy, I can't remember his name, it always annoys me. But he brought a guy in the prayer for Dublin that really struggled and ended up in a bad way. And he did like a like a speech or like a talk. Mm-hmm. And he was asking people, he was telling people what he experienced. He was asking, does anyone experience that? And I was going, Jesus, I do. That's, that's what happened to me here. Mm-hmm. And then I went, right, this is it. I need to get something sorted here because this could end up terribly. And then it ended up being stopping for a while. I was done for a while. And then here I am now. Yep, exactly. And, and like, you know, I guess the, the most important thing is everything's all, all right with you. And like, I know people and stuff we spoke to, things happen for a reason. So obviously if, you yeah. weren't feeling that way that time. You may have been out in Tokyo at the minute having a medal. You don't know. Yeah, <laughs> could be. And my dad always asked me to regret it. And I don't. Simply because at that time, it, just, it could have got a lot worse than what it was. So I don't regret it. Of course, I'm watching them out there and going, that's brilliant. And I'm over the moon for them. But there's not a part of me that goes, I wish I was there. Mm. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I go, I really wish I was there. And I was on the podium and stuff like that. But I don't regret it because I look back and go, what was going on at that time could have got a lot worse. Keeps the hunger, I guess, going for you as well in the pros. You know, where you're going, well, I can't get a, a medal at Tokyo or I can't get a medal at Olympics, but I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a world title. You know, and that just keeps the fire burning. And to show people that, and even kids, like, there probably could be kids out there now that are dealing with the same thing at the moment. Mm-hmm. And to show kids that it's okay to go, right, this is happening, deal with it. And you can always come back to it. There's, whenever I stopped, that wasn't about closed, that wasn't it done. I could always have the option to come back to the amateurs if I wanted or in my case, go pro. And I know a Jay Quigley on last week as well, obviously won quite a lot as an amateur as well. And he was watching the Olympics and going, you know, what if? But as I say, he's now in a journey now where he's going, his next fight about a world title and that will make up for it. Exactly. We're not getting the Olympics and stuff as well, you know. Um, obviously, your two fights so far as a pro have both been behind closed doors. You know, as, as we sort of talk, talk about it at the start, which obviously which is then leading to like your second sort of debut. But how did you find fighting Jamie Quinn and, and Jordan, Jordan Ellison behind closed doors? Did you find much of a difference? Some people have said, I think Mick actually said yesterday that some of his fights behind closed doors felt like sparring sessions. Um, yes, I know. See, see, when you go away to these like, European tournaments and all these multi-nations and all, there's never a lot of people in the crowd. The only other people in the crowd are the R fighters from the R countries. So I'm used to it in a sense. Like there's no, there was no big, Jesus, no one's here. What am I going to do? In my head, I was fighting. It doesn't really matter who's there, who's not there. I'm fighting. I'm in a fight that's time to, be, to perform here. So the only difference was traveling to England, doing the COVID test and doing the weigh-ins and stuff like that. That was the only difference. The fighting bit, the fighting bit I can do. It's the rest of the stuff I have to learn as I go along. Did you feel any nerves, sort of, you know, whenever you made your debut last year, did you sort of feel like, well, what, this is pro boxing, you know, what? You know, did it feel any different for you or did you just take it sort of in your Yeah, the, whole, the build up felt different. The build up to it was different, but the ring walk all was different. But see, as soon as I got in and the bell rang, I was, I was back to business again. Like, it was, that was my first fight from the European Games in 2019. And I swear to God, you could have just clicked your fingers and clicked from that to this. I was just straight back into fighting again. Yeah, it was if the time you'd sort of been out of the ring, you just forgot about, you know, it was just like, forgot all about it. And, and like I say, the two, two fighters you've had so far are probably. Two very well respected, you know, class type journeymen, which probably both of them could actually, if they wanted, could actually get wins every every other week. But they just decided they want to actually help progress people, um, yeah. you know, from amateur boxing or in the pro ranks. How how have you found the sort of progress, the transition across from amateur to pro? Has it been much of a change? Yes, um, no, yes, because of the, again the build up to it is the only big different thing you could do. It's one fight. I'm used to having. Go to tournament and have five fights, maybe. Whereas this is all this build ups for one night, one fight. That's the only real difference. Um, but whenever I did turn pro, me, Jamie, my father, and Balanzo, we went and had a meeting down the coffee shop. And Jamie explained it because I was saying, I'm going, I'm staying with my dad. And he was saying, like, we haven't got the experience of pros or so we just asked, just sort of ground them a wee bit. Mm. And I said, listen, that's the best way to explain it. Pull and snigger. Two different sports, two different games, but the objective's quite the same. You put the ball in the hole. And that's that's the attitude I took to it. And I'll take a couple of fights to sort of get going. I know, obviously, going back to, to Jay quickly again from last week, he was sort of saying his first eight fights, eight stoppage ones, but it took him time to 
you know, he just kept thinking from amateur boxing, going, need to knock him out, need to knock him out. You know, and now he sort of looks back on it and going, I wish I'd have taken my opponents a few rounds so I could adapt more into the, the pro ranks. So yeah. I guess it's good to see that sort of hindsight of somebody ahead of you and you're going, you know what, I'll not knock him out, I'll just go the four or six rounds and, and learn the experience. Well, I, I did my first two fights, six rounders, so I sort of jumped ahead a wee bit. And the two guys that have fought, you maybe fight six or seven fights in, maybe. Mm-hmm. Like there was no walkovers, there was no boys to steamroll, the boys came, maybe they didn't come to win. But they came to survive and have a fight like. So that'll stand me in good stead. Um this guy I'm fighting on Friday, he has no pushover, like he's not coming to he's not coming to Belfast just to go this is Berlin and get steam rolled. Mm-hmm. He's coming to have a go like so I I enjoy that more because I've always said I'd rather just get in and start fighting. I don't want to be doing the whole you know, you fight a guy from Bulgaria who's coming there ready right to fall over. Yeah. Like I'm I'd rather get in and be tested from the start. And, and your opponent on Friday, um, Ed Harrison, um, he's, he's taken two unbeaten records as well. So, you know, I know when people look at the record and go, he's two wins, seven defeats, you have to look at it and go, I don't want to be the third undefeated boxer. He's, no, he's there's beaten. no chance I'd be the third. Not a hope in hell. But he deserves respect. I guess, as you say, people look at the record and go, she's going to destroy him. But he deserves the respect. And the same as Jimmy Quinn and the same as Jordan, like them two boys. The Rackers might not have been the most beautiful thing in the world, but they deserve the respect that they get. Mm-hmm. So, it's the same attitude. I'm getting into this fight. This is a world fight. And it's having that sort of sort of thing as well. I know Tom McCullough was obviously beat uh, by Brett Fido a few weeks ago as well. So, you know yourself, you need to stay switched on and don't relax yeah. for one second because these guys... One step take... like that, and that could be you sniggered. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've always said, like, I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose ever. Yeah. But to lose in your first couple of fights is detrimental. So I don't plan on losing any time or any time soon for that matter. And, and Jamie himself has probably said you've been probably one of the most, um, one of the signings he's probably most um, happiest about or probably the pride sort of because of the, the amateur experience stuff you had. He really feels like he's on this sudden obviously with signing you. So I guess that, and that belief in going, we've signed an absolute cracker here that pretty much everybody should have been after. And, you know, it's, yeah. I guess that's good. Good advice to sort of have at the start to go, Jamie Conlon really thinks a lot of me here. I could really go far. Yeah, definitely. And even at the start, like I used to pick Jamie's brain all the time about what we're training or what difference they need to make. And he was always very much to just keep doing what you're doing. Like, anytime I need to tax him for a bit of advice, it's five minutes and he's taxing back again. So having that in my corner, again, is invaluable. It definitely is. And it obviously it helps very well. And like, you've been, you know, a lot of the pros you're now involved with. You obviously know them very well, maybe growing up in the same areas or being in the same team. So you can all pick each other's brains and, and get, the, yeah. get the best out of everybody else. I was laughing. I did it the other day with MTK, I think it was, and they were talking about stuff like that. Now, Sam, me and Fergus Quinn have been on the same card three times in a row now. So I was laughing. Well, me, and, me and Fergus are probably going to win a world title on the same night. It seems to be that me and him are skipped the guy. I think he's with Jamie as well. Mm. Jamie's married to him too, so we're both... We're like two brothers, we are. And keep winding each other up going. If he's fighting for such and such a title, I'm fighting for a title. You know, well, this is it. I've seen him. He was meant to fight. There was one day he was meant to fight in the medical. His medical got messed up. Like a cancel. I was going, how did I fight in that date? Now he's meant to fight maybe a few weeks later. But it was just interesting. I'd lie. I actually quite like me and Fergus to stay in the same card every single time. So when one of these get announced in the card, we'll always expect to see the other. Getting... I said, listen, see if one of us gets announced. The other one's probably not far behind. Tom and Hardy, the Hardy brothers. That's it. <laughs> like what they call the top of rush. The obviously your initial opponent, obviously in the field, like, um, you're, you're, when it was initially announced, your your many fight Sean Duffy. Um, obviously he's been pulled off the card, but does that you know what's I was going to be a repeat of your 2017 Ulster final as well? Does that show the obviously the intent you have as a pro that you're ready to jump straight in the deep end where it's needed? Of course. Uh Jimmy fought me about that fight. He fought me and told me I was fighting the fella. And he says, we're looking at an all-Irish fight. He says, I'm fine with that. He didn't give me a name at that stage. And then he came back to me and said, Sean. And he says, yep, no problem. There's no there's no one I won't fight. I've always said that I'll fight Jamal, Jamal Hearns, the world champion of my boot tomorrow. And I says, I'll fight him now. Obviously, that's pan in the sky because I'm, I'm still very much learning. But mm-hmm. that's my kind of attitude I'm taking into it. There's, I'm going to have to fight the best at some stage. So there's no point saying no to anybody else. Exactly, it's like the Olympics sort of thing here with Kurt and stuff as well, you know, they, they, they're they able to beat the number one, so why can't you? Yeah. 
You exactly. Know? I've lived. I've lived my whole boxing career, always beating number ones and always saying I'm going to be number one, winning medals and doing. So I'm not going to change that attitude now. Like there's no cherry picking. I think that's what it gets called. And I've done that for me. Yep. And obviously, I guess with that attitude and stuff as well, not be long before you were getting title fights and stuff as well, because you're just you want to get in there and they say, how do you hold your jeans up on a Saturday night if you don't have a belt to put around them? What's well, this? Is it. I I've put total faith in the NTK and Jamie. Like, whatever they say, as Jamie's the boss. I always call him the boss. Whatever he says, I do. So whatever he says, I'm fighting. That's who I'll fight. If I'm fighting for a, if he says you're fighting for a belt, I'm fighting for a belt. And I say that's the only way to go. Uh, 2019, obviously, the last time we had the fella. Um, were you at the last fella, or, or did you watch it on the TV? I had tickets to go. I think my parents, I think Molly and Daddy might have went. And a few of my mates went, I think a couple of cousins went. But I had tickets to go and ended up, I get these bad migraines. My mother, God rest her, she, her trait that she gave to me was migraines. I ended up getting one of them that night. And I thought, no, I'm not going. So I sat and watched on the TV. So I've experienced it a wee bit, but I haven't been there. Funny enough, I actually seen a video today, and the Kennedy posted a video today of him at the fila, and you can see my dad in the background dancing. <laughs> so I'm laughing, going with dad's man from 2019, being in the crowd watching until 2021, being in the corner, during it. And obviously you watching the TV and then with everybody else being out there and going, what a night, 10,000 people going absolutely crazy. And now you're going to be in the middle of the experience. And like, who knows? I can't wait. A couple of years time, you could be fighting there for a bigger title. You'd be fighting for world title. You just don't know the a way. A couple of years, you could be headline look for all we know. Could be. You know, and I say that's what you want. You know, it's that ambition and going, where do I want to have my dream fight? You know? Yeah. Um, Celtic Park, if anyone's ever asked me, Celtic Park, I've always said I want to fight in Celtic Park. I remember Slag and the Jamie one time talking about it. I'm a massive Celtic fan and they always have been. Yeah. And funny enough, I was actually talking to John Hudson today. He was meant to come over to watch the fights, but I think he got tied up at work. But if anyone was to say, a dream destination to fight Celtic Park. Celtic Park. Obviously, Caseman Park's been done up there at the moment as well. So Yeah. I think it, is it, it got the go ahead, the go now, did it? Yeah. So I think. What's what, I think I always see Kevin, Kevin Ajarko, he was saying about it, about Caseman Park as well. So he stole Caseman. Crook Park would be another one too, but I think Michael has maybe mentioned Crook Park before. And, and so Celtic Park. Quick, quickly announced, he said next week, Crook Park for him and Canelo, you know. So you want to, you you want to, you want to fight in the big venues, you know. And it, this is it. And I guess, obviously, the, the more people you can get in, the more money you're going to make, you know, as well, and, yeah. and create more memories and stuff. Um, obviously, not looking too far ahead from the field, because I know, obviously, your focus is on Ed Harrison on Friday night. But, obviously, everything go, everything goes as planned. Everything continues to move as it is with, with COVID. I'm guessing the plan is to stay as, as active as possible. Yeah. Um, I fight every weekend, and that's the goal on our show. It's like... The first two fights I had were very far separated, and between the second and the third, there's a big gap as well. I'd love to, and again, it's all COVID permitting. Um, if Jamie thinks it's the right move, just go. I'm ready just to go now. I'll fight every month. And I know Sean, I think Sean's first year as a pro, he fought eight times, you know, from, from August 2018 in Windsor Park to, I think, the, the, the fail in 2019. I think he fought eight times within that period. Yeah. So you know that it can be done, and, you know, I guess. You know, for, for Sean and Stephen Donnelly, obviously they got to fight in America and stuff as well. So, you know the potential's there. You could go and fight in America on a card and on a card and go, and, what am I doing here? You know, it could just happen yeah. so quickly. Exactly. And even even at this, I mean, I fight on the field. This is only my third fight on such a big card. Usually guys don't get this. So, I'm very lucky like that too. Definitely. What an opportunity to have. Um, you're not obviously the only McGivern in the family that obviously boxes. Um, your brother, Jack. Um He's obviously yes. still boxing as well. Was was you turning pro? Is it is it giving him more of a hunger turnover? Or are you having to sort of say to him, Jack, stay in the amateurs a bit longer? You know. Yeah, it's exactly stuff. what you just said there. Yeah, he's. I don't know why it's just because he's seen me do it, but our Jack, even our Jack style would quite suit the program. Like I've had our Jack in the pads and sparred with him, and he hits like a horse. Like we always laugh about it, but he, if he was to hit you, like he would turn you into dust. Um, but I've said to him. Don't go down the whole route of having to grind it out for years upon years before you even get a shot. Why not stay amateur for the while? Go to the Commonwealth Games. Win a man with the Commonwealth Games or win the Commonwealth Games because he's more than capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. I said to him, go and do better what I did. I come away with your bronze. And the bronze to me was useless. Why not mm -hmm. go and win a gold medal and then come back? And if it is truly something you want to do, go from there then. See, go and experience the Commonwealth Games, experience stuff like that, and then make your decision. If you want to go pro, then there's no reason why I couldn't even be a cracking professional boxer. But I said to him, 
stay amateur for now. Go to the games, see what happens then, and then just take it, take your time. Like, don't be rushing into anything. It's a bit more of experience, and I guess you know if, if he obviously follows your advice with that, and obviously goes to next come also even the Olympics. At least you'll be ahead of him to obviously guide him on his path as a pro then yeah. as well. And as the body, right body's going to be experiencing, yeah. Definitely is. And it's, said, it's all very valuable that way. And he has, he, our Jack, I always say, hasn't done what he's capable of doing. Mm-hmm. Like our Jack is, and people don't see that as much. He's so capable. Like the other seniors last year, not the last year, the year before maybe, he fell short in the final. And that's just because the nerves got him. And people don't understand how good our Jack is. Like I always say, our Jack's a better boxer than I am. Just hasn't got that chance yet to prepare himself and really show everyone. And I guess sometimes the defeat, you know, in the final and you know nerves the next time around he does, you know, get to that stage again. It's like, well, I know what the nerves was before I can get through it. You know, it's yeah. Well, this the old seniors coming up. I think they're September or December, maybe. I'm not sure, but they're sort of the they're the first hurdle to the Commonwealth Games, and there's no reason I fully expect them to go and win them and go to the Commonwealth Games. Definitely. So we'll obviously have Jag turning pro hopefully in a couple of years' time. You never know, 2024, next Olympics. You know, it's only three well, years away. Well, the Olympics at the minute, and I'm saying them, like, there's no reason why you shouldn't be licking your lips. Thinking that's going to be made in a couple of years. Exactly, and it's that motivation that you, that you want. Um, obviously, I'm pronouncing this right, but obviously you're a BIA um, athlete. Um, yes. And, and as you said yourself, they're elite level training. Tell us obviously more behind BIA. Obviously, we had Colin Murphy um, on the other week. Um, we'll not mention anything to do with the coffee. Um, yes, don't imagine the coffee. Uh, but obviously, tell us more about BIA and obviously how they've helped you. I know they've been with you for quite a while, but how they've helped you and why you think they're such an elite, elite at what they do. So I started with Stuart. Stuart's one of the three members of BIA. I started with him, I want to say 2017 maybe, before the all seniors to the Commonwealth Games. 2017 probably, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, my training then switched from being a good to being amazing. And I've worked with coaches all across the world, SNC coaches in Ireland and all across the world. And there's no one that I would trust more than Stuart. So I put all my faith. He structures our program for the camp. But that takes care of the boxing. And he structures, Stuart will structure what we're doing, when we're doing it, why we're doing it. And the why is the most important thing. It's not just throw these things in willy-nilly. Everything I do is tracked. Everything I do is monitored and wrote down somewhere. Like you could probably go in, there'll be a book about this training camp somewhere. You'll have a laptop somewhere and it's maybe a book. And that's the reason why. Then the weight cut, 59 kilos for me is quite, like I would be quite big with 59 kilos for mm. Super Feather. So getting down to it is easy because of Stuart and his methods and everything he's put in place. So without demons, you'd be snickered, to be honest. You wouldn't be nowhere next to near as fit enough and making the weight would be deadly. And that's the most important thing sometimes is making the weight and keeping all the strengths you already have, keeping your power, you know, making sure you're not weak to the body and everything else. You know, it's yeah, and we one percent that that can make a difference sometimes. And well, as I said, I could probably make this weight for this fight without actually even doing a sweat session. And when I think this morning, it was two kilos over this morning, I'm two days away, so I can make the weight honestly without even trying. When when, when you when you're saying it in that sort of aspect, then you know, would super featherweight be? You're right, the weight you look to go, or maybe potentially coming down another four pound if the featherweight. Um, featherweight to me seems like a country mile away. Um, I boxed 56 one year and nearly killed myself making the weight. Mm-hmm. I've meant to go to the European under 22, I want to say, and physically couldn't make weight. Making 56, there's probably no chance. 57, maybe I could maybe do it mm-hmm. if I really knuckle down and try my best, but at the minute. I'm happy enough, super feather, 59 kilos is comfortable. I like guess 60 had it been still at the Olympics and stuff like that, that would have been ideal. But 59 kilos is where I'm at for now. Yeah, it's, it's making sure you don't go too far. To say you don't want to obviously detriment your health and everything else. You know, obviously yeah. with, with weight cuts and everything else, you start affecting kidneys and everything else. So the last thing you want to do is detriment your health. So at least if you stay strong at super feather, that's exactly what you want. You know, you've already... Well, I think I'll be absolutely massive for super feather. Hate and strength ways, I would imagine. Again, I don't know just yet. But 59 kilos for me seems like that's my optimal sort of weight. It definitely is. And we've obviously got the end of the questions we have. Before we let you go, obviously we know sponsors um, and even family and everything else play a massive part. Um, obviously, I know you have quite a lot of sponsors, so maybe you'll, you maybe just tag them and stuff afterwards. Is there anybody you want to give any special thanks to for, for what's got you to where you are so far? Well, it's just... Bia for a start, of course, and then obviously my family, my ma, my dad, my ma, God rest her, she was on my back 
we're actually wearing the fake gear we're, we're going to wear says my mother on the back of it mm-hmm. she's always had my back so she's going to continue to literally have my back this time but as far as the sponsors and stuff go there's a list of them and I don't want to leave anyone out so I'm not going to try and list them all off just in case but without them and I've said this the other day on NTK's Instagram without them I couldn't be where I am or do what I'm doing mm-hmm. without the team that I have and they're all part of the team they're not just sponsors they're all part of my team so if I didn't have them and financially I wouldn't be able to do it and then the services like the likes of Halo and stuff make my meals they are all part of me making the weight via it's part of me making the weight so without all them this doesn't happen so as I say I'll tag them all in it I just don't want to forget anyone it's, it's one of them things sometimes that I think I'd, I'd own Duffy I think I'm on the other week and he started mentioning all his ones out now he's going you don't need shorts for fighting anymore you need tracks of bottoms because he had that many sponsors on my shorts like the, the guy Kevin, the guy, one of my sponsors, that actually bought the shorts for me to fight in. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to put them up yet. I'm going to wait until fight night because they're the nicest shorts. Like, I had to give them to him for his office. And as a part of me really wants to go, Kevin, can I just keep these? Because I love them that much. Mm-hmm. But the back of them, and my dad was saying the back of them was my for the shorts. And I was going, Dad, we'll see without them. This isn't happening. So putting them on a set of shorts is nothing for what they do for me. So it's no worry to me, really. Definitely. It's like the old style. Do you remember the Fast and Furious thing where they put like, they called it like a shopping list down the side of the car, everything that's on it, you know, with sponsors. Ah. But, but sponsors play, as I said, without them, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even have had the opportunity to go pro. And, you know, if there's any more sponsors out there and stuff as well, of course, you'll always find a spot for them, whether you have to wear a, a well, hat or anything under the ring. To if there's any sponsors that want to sponsor me, I'll happily get a tattoo in my back. Just, or you plug there in case anyone wants to jump on, I get your logo tattooed on me. Funny, it's, it's something we haven't seen in boxing, but you see in MMA is, is them getting the, the sponsors. Up. People get the guy. I seen him one time, I can't remember who it was. I, I couldn't tell you if the fight was either, but I think he was Argentinian, maybe. And he had something painted on his back, but it starts to just wash off after a while. I'm sure all your mates will be looking them around your, your knuckles and everything else to be leaving you. Ah, we'll be see some colors. of the things that I say to them, it's my first shorts. I wanted to get something on the shorts it represents. Just so, something stupid that they can all see and go, mm-hmm. fuck, you got that on the shorts because of us. The list that I got was ridiculous and it never happened and it probably never will happen now because I said to them, take it serious here, I want to do something nice. There was a list the length of your arm of ridiculous things <laughs> that you couldn't have on shorts that had to blur it out on the TV. I seen your take over the other day that you're always getting asked all questions that like, um, That's ridiculous. What, what's an egg? You know, what, what food category is an egg and stuff? I was, you're going, uh, big girl asked me that and to be honest, it stumped me out from myself. It's protein and then it was going, no, there's fats in it and then it was going, what does he mean? Like, what? <laughs> That got me going so it did. But that, <laughs> there was, that was very tame compared to what was actually in that list. <laughs> I'm sure there was all sorts in it. Uh, nah. But James, obviously, well, thank you obviously for coming in, involved and obviously coming on in Fight Week and obviously having a chat with us. It's been an absolute pleasure starting to get a bit, bit more to know about you. Obviously, we're going to be there on Friday night to obviously cheer you on the victory as well. Um, but yes, obviously, yes. enjoy your obviously last day or so of sort of getting prepared for fight. Um, we'll obviously yeah. see you at the weigh-in on Thursday as well. Brilliant, ah, yeah, the way in. The way in will be good crack. This will be my first one in front of a crowd. There's a, there's a crowd going to, isn't there? There's like a public kind so. of thing. I think, they're looking at, I think they're looking outside the definition of the weather's good and obviously inside. And obviously, if we started going, I need to make sure my boxers are clean and, you know, that you're. Well, this is it. I, may, I was thinking, I was chatting to my girlfriend the other day and I was thinking, I might do something funny. I don't know, I'll see. She said to me, don't take it serious. But I don't know, I'll see. It's all about crack, isn't it? Was it not Joe Fitzpatrick before done the whole. Borat, you know the, the man, Borat the thing? The that I, the that was my first suggestion, I'll do a Mankini, and then she went, if you do that, we'll break up. I thought, right, I don't think it's worth risking that, is it? <laughs> we'll definitely look forward to seeing when you come out on Thursday. Uh, I'll have to think of something funny, so well. We definitely will, but listen, obviously, it's been a pleasure, a good laugh, sort of, along the way as well. Um, I'm sure we'll obviously get to catch up at some stage in the future as well, and, and try again and see how things are going with you. Brilliant, oh, after the fight, I'll see you after the fight, no doubt. Definitely. But James, listen, thanks very much. Um, we'll catch up again soon. Not a problem, mate. See ya. Here's James. Take care.